You're listening to The Back 40, the podcast for Ontario farmers, covering topics and issues that matter most to Ontario agriculture. Brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm the host of The Back 40, Mike Brine, agribusiness specialist at Trillium Mutual Insurance. Over the years, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of concern uh, about uh, conservation of the soils in Ontario, particularly from a farming perspective. If we go back far enough, I can think of winter days where we haven't had much snow cover. There's been a lot of plowing. And by the end of the day, the wind has pretty well turned that snow black. Thankfully, we don't see that nearly as much as we used to. There's a lot of new conservation techniques that have been used over the last 30 years that have really improved that. But it's a, a target that we're always trying to improve on. Conservation authorities in Ontario are a vital part of keeping the water quality and keeping our soil where it's supposed to be. We're talking today with Chris Van Esbrook from the Maitland Valley Conservation Authority, a little bit about some of the programs that the conservation authorities put forth and some of the role that they play. Chris, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So Chris, what's your role with the Maitland Valley Conservation Authority? So I'm the stewardship coordinator at Maitland Valley Conservation Authority. So at Maitland, in the stewardship department, we are the people who uh, get out, meet with landowners, and provide them with technical advice and help them source out funding to address uh, projects that they may want to do on their properties. Things ranging from erosion control to tree planting to maybe habitat improvements, a broad range of BMPs. Basically, you're the people that are going to be out on the ground if somebody says, I've got a project that I want to tackle, can you help me? That's right. We're, we're a boots on the ground organization and we're, and we're there to help. So as a conservation authority, what's your role in the conservation of our agricultural soils? We're out there to provide technical advice, help farmers address drainage issues or soil erosion issues they may have on their farm. We do a lot of promotion of things like cover crops, different ways of protecting your soil and, and keeping it in place. We're also there to provide advice if you've maybe you've got areas of unproductive land that you'd like to maybe do something more uh, natural with so we can help you naturalize those areas, whether it's for wildlife habitat or, or pollinators or whatever your, your interest may be, we're there to provide that advice. Often it's getting out onto the farm, seeing site because every site is different, every site has its unique challenges and opportunities. So it's often a field visit, talking about what the landowner's priorities are. And then from there, it's that technical advice, helping them source out funding, uh, because there's always a list of opportunities for farmers to get funding for different projects they may want to do. So we're there to sort of walk them through that uh, as best we can. I know there's been a lot of talk in the media right now about carbon and planting trees, and certainly that's a part of the role that the conservation authorities play, but there's a lot more to it than that. I was a member of Scouts for three years, and every year we were planting trees somewhere. And for us, it's the Upper Thames Conservation Authority, and that's what I would associate with them from 13 mm -hmm. to 15-year-old there. That's what I saw them doing. So we have farmers who are interested in maybe having trees planted on their property. It's a good idea to reach out to a conservation authority, whether you want to plant the trees yourself or, 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 or get it done through them, they'll have different options. Many of the conservation authorities will have a tree sale in the spring. So it's that opportunity to get an order in. Yeah, and, and it's really important. I mean, we heard a lot about the uh, tree planting and uh, it doesn't need to take up agricultural land. I know uh, as scouts, we were involved in planting into worked out gravel pits. And if you go back into that area now, more than 40 years ago, you can see the results of that. You've got some pretty large trees that are in there. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I would encourage people to, to think about those unprofitable areas that are on their farm that may make sense to, to restore. Windbreaks, the data is there. If you keep the windbreak narrow, it's gonna pay for itself and some uh, with the yield you'll see in field. Lots of producers putting in windbreaks uh, every year uh, through through these different programs that I've mentioned. They're another great practice to look into. And particularly, we've talked before about uh, people that have taken out the fence bottoms, and uh, that's a really good spot to go in and, and replace that. And you get benefit on both sides of that windbreak, too. Anything that, that stops that wind from just whistling right across the property is going to cut down on soil erosion. 
they also worked with shelter belts around the homestead or around barns, a lot of good uses for trees. Again, it's another another thing to reach out to your conservation authority staff about to, and, and see if they have some options for you for either technical advice on the design aspect and potentially funding uh, to help as well. On an individual basis, what are some of the things that farmers can do that really will protect the soil? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, we try to encourage uh, farmers to do full suite of BMPs. What I mean by that is it's going to be tailored to to your farm. There's often not one BMP, one silver bullet that's going to address uh, these issues on a particular farm. So we try to break it down into uh, what we call avoid, control, trap, and treat uh, BMPs. So the first set of practices that we really try to promote are or what are those things we can do that are going to keep soil and nutrients in place uh, right off the bat? So that first raindrop that hits your field, uh, what can we do right there to keep things in place? And that's often uh, we like to promote things like reduced tillage. Um, however you achieve that, there's a number of different ways that you can accomplish that on your farm. Keeping a good crop rotation and uh, the use of cover crops to keep that soil covered year round. And then things like the four hours. So we're, we're, uh, only applying, you know, what the crop needs and what you need to maintain good fertility. For our listeners that aren't familiar with what 4Rs are, could you give us a little bit of a background on what exactly you mean by that? Absolutely. So the 4Rs is a way of looking at uh, how you are going to properly manage nutrient applications on your farm. So it's applying things at the right source, the right rate, the right place, and the right time. That's whether you're, you're going to apply manure or a commercial fertilizer putting it on when the crop can use it the, the, the right time, where the crop can best use it and protect it from runoff. So that's the right place. Often that's subsurface application. And then the rate is putting it on at the rate that is going to maintain your fertility levels that is meeting what the crop requires. So those, those are the four hours in general. And the general idea here is that we're not putting something on at the wrong time or in excess, that it's going to end up in a waterway somewhere. Absolutely. Now, you talked about cover crop, reduced tillage. That's one of the things that, from a farmer standpoint, we've been kind of taught over the years that we don't want to leave that ground bare at any time during the growing season or during the winter there, because that can result in a lot of erosion. Do we still see a lot of that, or has the uptake really been much better for protecting the soil by using those techniques? I think it's definitely a positive trend. We've seen more adoption of it. There's still uh, room for improvement, uh, oh, yeah. uh, definitely. One of the big reasons for that, in, in my view, is with the way our winters are changing, we're seeing soil bear more often. We tend to have more thaws through the winter. So we, our soil is, is more susceptible to erosion now than, than maybe it was 30 years ago. So uh, there's even more of a, an emphasis and importance of getting it right. I go back quite a few years here to where unless somebody had a pasture field or a hay field, everything was plowed in the fall. And I mentioned when we started here that uh, it was pretty common in the wintertime when the furrows started peeking through and you get a nice windy, sunny day, you'd get that erosion, you'd see that soil black. We don't see that nearly so much, much less of a moldboard plow being used in the fields around, certainly in my area here. That's not to say that there isn't place in your techniques for using tillage, though. No, that, that's a really, a really good point. There's going to be a need for tillage. You know, people who have livestock in their operations, they've got manure, it's got to get out. We were talking about that, the 4R piece. Incorporating that manure may be your best practice to really reduce the, the runoff losses that we're going to see. Manure left on the surface, exposed to rainfall, snow melts, that leads to a lot, a lot of losses too. So Tillage certainly has its place. We've got really tough falls where fields are, are getting mucked up, and it's a real balance. Uh, one of the practices that certainly has taken off in the last 30 years is, is strip till, and that's a really great practice in my view. It's that, it's that balance of lets you do enough tillage, prepare that seed bed. It also gives you that opportunity to get nutrients into the ground, you know, below the surface to protect it from runoff. And you're still able to leave a lot of residue or enough residue on top to prevent uh, some of those erosion issues that we're talking about. So there have been uh, different variations of uh, reduced tillage with vertical till that's trying to find that balance. 
Yeah, and to be fair, 30 years ago, we didn't have the machinery or the techniques. Uh, certainly, GPS and auto steer has been a game changer for something like strip tillage, where I know I've seen people that uh, if they were planting it on their own, the rows crossed at the end, and sometimes in the field, it would be very difficult for them to manage to stay in those strips. But that, that auto steer and GPS manages to control very tightly where the seed goes in relation to where the fertilizer goes and, and that sort of thing. It opens up some really interesting opportunities for managing cover crops and incorporating cover crops as well. If you're able to find that balance of maintaining residue cover with a cover crop, but have a nice seed bed and dry things up quicker uh, in spring. Now, speaking of cover crop, cover crops are not a new idea. If you go back to my grandfather, he used cover crops. They used them a lot for, for things like weed suppression and that's that sort of thing. And certainly when I was younger, the main cover crop you saw in my area was putting red clover on wheat in the spring and uh, hoping that you got a catch in the fall. And we just still do see some of that. But we, we're seeing a lot more people that are working that wheat ground vertical tillage and then go in and plant a crop in behind it to protect that soil. I find it uh, really interesting just the amount of new techniques that are being tried, people experimenting to make things work. What we really hoping to see more adoption of is that idea of leaving increased residue cover over the winter, because uh, as I said about our winters, we're going to see soil more exposed. So it's even more important to keep it protected. One of the things that we do promote is the idea of an overwintering cover crop or leaving the residue of a cover crop on the surface over winter. Those uh, tillage practices that we've talked about, strip till lets you do that. Vertical tillage, if it's not too aggressive, lets you do that as well, leave enough residue on top. So it's certainly evolved and a lot of opportunity, I feel, to uh, incorporate cover crops and achieve that overwinter protection uh, that we're looking for. If you go back, again, I'm going to go back 30 years ago and we were in this area just starting out with, with the no-till. It was, you got to leave everything on the surface. And uh, then we started getting an awful lot of buildup. And then it was, well, you need to leave like 60% cover on for, for that. So the techniques have evolved significantly and certainly the something like strip till and, and vertical tillage have allowed us to manage that. We've talked about the cover crops and the managing that. What other sort of uh, techniques are out there for people in a good management situation there to protect their soils? The next set of, of practices that we, we try to promote at some point, no matter what you do on your land, whether it's reduced tillage or, or cover crops, people are going to have areas in their field where, where surface water starts to collect, starts to run. Uh, so that needs to be managed a little differently. And there are a lot of different options we can take there. A lot of things that we promote, there are things like the erosion control structures. So um, water and sediment control basins. A lot of people just call them berms. Basically, they're finding areas in your field to slow water down, spread it out, uh, let it soak in, uh, and then drain it in a controlled way underground. So you've eliminated that gully that's forming in your field and that maybe we're filling in every spring with the cultivator and we can drive over it. But if you don't address that, it's a it's a huge loss of soil from, from our farm. So that idea of a soil and erosion control structures is, is that next set of BMPs. If uh, you can't control it with uh, those, those berms, water and sediment control basins, that next practice in that line is grass waterways. Now there, I think people are familiar with them. They're really tough to farm around, but this is a technology aspect coming in again. If we are able to, uh, with, with GPS, control the sprayer a little better and make those easier to farm through, farm around, it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for the, for the farmer with that technology. There's nothing worse than having a grass waterway that somebody sprays with Roundup that kind of defeats the purpose of everything. Yeah, and they do need maintenance. They need to be mowed. Otherwise, you're, you're going to end up with a situation where the, they, the water starts running along the side of it. So the, it does complicate the management in a way, too. It's not something that you should maybe enter into lightly. You need to sort of fully understand the impact it's going to have on your operation and that, and that maintenance requirement. But they can certainly be very effective. And if everything you're doing, the cover crops, rotation, tillage system, and you're still having gullies, those are those next set of EMPs that are that are going to work for you. Yeah, and it's not a new idea. I, I remember my grandfather's farm, uh, and I worked that for a number of years. That there was a grassed waterway in that that we worked around. Now there's quite a difference there when you're talking like a 20 foot boom with a sprayer and and a uh, four row planter. It was pretty easy to work around. It, it was pretty easy to manage there that you didn't get yourself caught into trouble there. And it certainly did the job as far as stopping the soil erosion in that spot. But with larger equipment, they're a lot more difficult. And as you said, the technology has really helped to uh, manage those if you're in a spot where you just simply can't do anything else. 
you know, it would be nice and convenient if it was just one water run through your field. And maybe you, you can square off a field and, and break it into two. But I'm seeing it where you know, there's four. There's four yeah. water runs. In the, and that gets very difficult to, to manage if you need to make that many headlands. Or then it's not always nice uh, rectangular sections that's going to dice up in your field. So they're not for everyone, but they can certainly work. One of the things I'm hopeful about is that technology piece. that We'll be able to farm around them a little easier in the future. Yeah, the water never seems to run either down the field or across the field. It sort of runs diagonal, which further complicates the whole thing there that uh, creates problems with those, those grassed waterways. Is your organization in need of funding for a capital project? Trillium Mutual's Roots Community Fund provides funding towards projects such as renovations, expansions, and equipment purchases that support rural Ontario. Roots helps ensure that these organizations will remain a crucial part of the local community. To learn more about Roots, including how to apply, visit our website at trilliummutual.com and click Community at the top of the page. Now, a lot of these techniques and structures that you're talking about here, they're great, except that you can't always just manage to do those on your own farm. This often requires a coordination of neighbors. The berms are great, but if you don't have an outlet, you need one. And, so, and often that means going across someone else's property. But what's your role in these projects as far as the coordination there? These projects can get complex very quickly if they start to involve neighbors. You can imagine if you're on the downstream end receiving runoff from multiple farms upstream, by the time it gets to you, you don't have many options aside from maybe a grass waterway. You won't be able to build a berm big enough to hold it all back. The solution needs to involve your, your neighbors upstream. So the role that we will try to play is to get neighbors to talk to each other and, and see the value of addressing this sort of like as a watershed, as a system, uh, work together to address it. The flip situation can happen if, if you're on the upstream end and maybe you see the erosion and you want, want to address it. Like you said, Mike, if you don't have an outlet for it, a proper outlet, your options are very limited too. So it, it really does require neighbors working together in, in a lot of situations. We'll work with uh, farmers to work through those options. What can you do on your farm? And, and if they're totally out of options to, to address it by themselves, we can encourage them to work with their neighbors and help facilitate that conversation. In some instances, it, your way to go is, is probably start talking to the, the drainage superintendent and see if a, a municipal drain going through there is, is the way to go. The benefits there are you're going to have a properly designed outlet system. It's going to be maintained over the long term and you know people are going to all pay their share. So it doesn't end up on the downstream landowner or the upstream landowner try to do it themselves because it, once it starts involving multiple properties, it's not as straightforward anymore. And when you're talking water erosion, what is my problem can quickly become your problem as well. If, you, if I don't deal with that water or you don't let me give me an outlet or something like that, it's going to be your problem sooner or later because that water always tends to run downhill. Although I'm, I know there's a few uh, people have tried to run it uphill, that generally never works very well. Yeah, that's a big thing as in these conversations. We're not pointing fingers. It's not anyone's particular fault. It's just these issues are really just best addressed as a watershed, as a community, as neighbors to try to work through these things because one person can rarely do it on their own. That maybe is a little bit going back to what we used to do if you go back 40, 50, 60 years ago, where we did know our neighbors a little bit better and everybody was, there was a farm house on every property there. That was a lot more personal. With the smaller equipment, you could work around stuff and you could find those solutions there. Maybe we're starting to get back to that idea that uh, we need to manage these individually and across properties. One of the other things that we've seen in the past is with the cost of farmland and the value of uh, an acre of, of farmland, uh, drainage ditches that run through the center of a property there, people want to use as much of that land as they can. We have in the past certainly seen a lot of people working up very, very close to those uh, drainage ditches there. My brother once referred to somebody and said they're not happy unless that first furrow falls into the bottom of the ditch. I don't think that, that there's many that are that bad, but that's a key part of maintaining the drainage systems on the farm is not, is not get too close to those drainage ditches. We do need to see a bit of a buffer back from these drains. Just it does wonders for bank stability on the drains. We do see a lot of interest in, in getting buffers established along drains. The, the key thing that, that we find is just farmers got a lot to deal with already. And it can't be complicated. 
can't be another huge project that they've got to take and, and figure it all out on, on their own. So we find if we're able to source out the funding, do the work coordinating with the nurseries, get the stock and the planting contractors, keep it easy. There's lots of people who are quite willing and really interested in establishing those buffers. They may have their own reasons for wanting to do it, whether it's just appreciation of nature. They see that it helps stabilize the bank and, and keeps the sediment out and don't want the, the clean out bill uh, continually for the municipal drains and things. So there is quite a bit of interest, I, I feel, from, from landowners in establishing these buffers and, and staying back. But to your point, land is worth a lot. We do see people kind of creeping in towards the streams and, and fence rows coming out. These are really important natural features. Land is expensive, but what's really expensive is if we see the topsoil running down into the ditch, that gets very expensive because that topsoil does not regenerate itself, at least not very quickly. We don't see it as much as we used to, but we used to have a lot of fence lines that hadn't been taken out, at least in my area there. And if you go along the fence lines and have a look at the difference in the height between what the fence row is at and what the field is at, it, the fence row is always higher and uh, sometimes quite significantly higher. That There's a little bit of compaction there that happens, but it's also over the years, we've lost a fair amount of our soils. It's pretty expensive land if uh, it's running off the top of your property, off, off of all of your acres too. That's your best soil that blowing and landing in the fence line or, or washing off and, and pooling. Those fence lines that are, that are coming out that you mentioned, they all act like mini little berms. Every fence line is, is, a, is a little berm uh, that's sort of holding water back a bit. We've seen those catch uh, a lot of sediment and almost fill up like a bathtub. <laughs> and then the, yep. you've, lost that, you've lost that storage in, in, in the landscape. In this area here, we see a fair number of people that take fence lines out and then turn around and plant a proper buffer strip in with a couple rows of trees there. It's a, a matter of keeping them from creeping into the agricultural land while maintaining something that's going to prevent some erosion, stop some soil from uh, running across onto the neighbor's property, and just get that initial bit of that erosion stopped before it becomes a big problem. Look at those other opportunities you may have on your farm, whether it's it's squaring off an area by a wood lot or, or by a stream that may provide a lot of ecological value as well. Look for those opportunities because they're out there. Farmers know their land and if there's that spot that can't be drained it is, or whether it's a, a hillside that is not profitable, farmers know their land. Those are good areas to sort of restore, naturalize, do something different with as well. If they're not making you money in your egg operation, we can maybe try to do something of ecological value there too. I think that a lot of farmers with the advent of monitors on combines and knowing where the crop is actually coming from and some of those areas that we've tried in the past to build the nutrition on them, build the fertility, build the carbon and all the rest of it. And, and in many cases, it's just like, you know what, that's a piece of land that should never have been broken up and it probably should be restored back to a natural habitat there. And that would be good for the biodiversity. It'd also be really good for the farmer because they're not trying to get something out of there and finding that they're always putting more inputs into that than what they can possibly get out of it. Those areas, conservation authorities could help you come up with some, some alternatives for that uh, are maybe going to help your bottom line. So. so you do more than just come up with projects and help people coordinate too. You're also involved in some monitoring of water quality. What are you seeing from the mo your uh, monitoring that you're doing? The monitoring is, is really important because it gives us local data to understand trends and, and make decisions. We're able to understand what's happening or try to understand what's happening with our climate, what's driving water quality, it gives us that data set to, to ask those questions and come up with recommendations with, with local data. I think it's a really important piece of, of, of why, we, why we need to monitor. We are seeing the majority of uh, sediment and nutrients that, that's leaving the land is actually leaving during that non-growing season. And in particular, during a small number of big events through that non-growing season. So non-growing season is, you could think of it as November to uh, the 1st of April. Those big snow melt or rain on snow events, they're really what's driving a lot of the sediment and nutrients that's leaving. So the weather we have is, is the big driver. Differences year to year are, are often going to be driven by just, was it wet? Was it dry? Was it a large number of large storms or was the rain nice and gentle and, and spread out? That's a large part of what drives it. 
Another thing we do in this intensive uh, sub-watershed that we're monitoring is, is collect really detailed land management data. We use that, feed it into models to try to tease out more specifically what are those BMPs that are going to help us more on the landscape. And if we have limited resources, where should we direct grant dollars to and, and, and things like that. So that monitoring and that modeling is really points us towards a lot of these practices that we've, we've talked about, cover crops, erosion control, and the gullies, and the, the erosion in a channel can be a big source of the sediment that's ultimately leaving through a stream and, and getting out to the lake. We need to think about managing water quantity as well as a way of reducing that erosion in the channel. It highlights again the importance of making sure we're stabilizing those banks by staying back with the plow and uh, keeping it vegetated, whether that's grass or trees and shrubs but staying back is a, is a really key piece. That local data is, is, is just inval invaluable to us for recommendations. Yeah, and, and a lot of it comes back to the education of the landowners there as to uh, what they, they can see will often show them that there's some erosion there, but sometimes it's not. It's, it's, you find that when you start doing the monitoring and doing the measuring, and a little bit of education there can really help out on all, uh, for all parties there. You mentioned this before, but it's worth coming back to a little bit here. The biggest concern that everybody's going to have, of course, it's going to cost me a lot of money. But there's programs out there to help, programs out there to share some of that cost because it is more than just of an individual. It's a societal thing there. Can you comment a little bit on what sort of programs are out there for farmers? It does vary uh, across the province. So in my area, we're lucky to have county grant programs. So the, in Huron County, we have the Huron Clean Water Project, and they'll they'll come in with a 50% grant up to a maximum amount for all these things we've talked about: uh, erosion control, a lot of tree tree planting, for like fragile land retirement, um, wetland creation, uh, different things. There's a cover crop incentive as well. So there's depending on where you are, there there may be a, a county grant program and. And often those are, are administered by conservation authorities. So they're a great, great place to check if uh, you've got that available to you in your area. But there are often programs delivered through Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. A lot of uh, farmers will refer to it as the, the EFP, uh, the Environmental Farm Plan Grant. So if you've got an update environmental farm plan, you're often eligible to apply some of these more provincial or federal uh, funding programs that are out there. Conservation authority staff are great people to uh, check in with about that as well as you always reach out to Ontario Soil and Crop and, and they'll, they'll let you know of what's currently being offered. They'll fund the, these key BMPs that uh, we've been, we've been talk, talking about, ecological restoration or tree planting sort of grants that uh, are projects that we've talked about as well. There's lots of funding opportunities that come up through the year uh, to support these projects. Yeah, suffice it to say, keeping uh, in contact with your local conservation authority is something that, that can really help out with that as well, because uh, you're going to be people that find out about these and understand what all they'll apply to. If people do want to find out more about what programs are out there and what initiatives the uh, conservation authority is, uh, is involved in, how do they go about doing that? You may need to figure out uh, which conservation authority uh, is working in your area. So to do that, you can go to Conservation Ontario. Uh, and they'll have a map there to figure out who you should be contacting. Ontario Soil and Crop is a great resource. A lot of uh, programs will, will run through that organization. You can Google them and find their website. They'll have a list of the, the programs that are currently offered across the province. And for something that's a little bit more local, you can check with your local conservation authority as well. Absolutely. It's a problem that uh, has been front of mind for a lot of years. And it's not going to go away, but the, thankfully, some of the new programs and new techniques that are out there, uh, we should see uh, a continued decrease in the amount of erosion. Chris, I want to thank you for taking the time today to, to talk to us. We've been talking to Chris Van Esbrook from the Maitland Valley Conservation Authority today about soil conservation and things that farmers can do to help preserve the soil. Chris, thanks for being part of the program. Thank you very much. You've been listening to The Back 40, brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance. Join us in two weeks for Canada's Ag Day, when our special guest will be Senator Rob Black. That's next time on The Back 40.
Be sure to subscribe to The Back 40 wherever you find your favorite podcasts so that you don't miss an episode. The Back 40, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm Mike Brine. Until next time, take care and stay safe.